do my coding anyway. So um, it doesn't make too much difference where I do that from. Yes, for, for most of us, it hasn't made much difference. We, maybe we have some of us, our student branch has become very efficient. Yeah, they could find you <laughs> and good. request you for, uh, for such a sharing. Yeah. It has been a boon for us in some sense, not in every sense. Sure. In some sure. sense of reaching out to people like you. Yeah, I think it's made people connect a little bit more digitally at least, which is nice. So. Yeah, so there's always some positive side of this pandemic. Yeah, sure. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, sir, can we so, start? Yeah, yes, please, sir. which is it's time. Okay, thank you, sir. So, uh, good morning to all dear members, participants, and the next speaker. So, I am Anupama Thakur. I am the chair of IEEE ACSIR CSIO student branch. So, I welcome you to IEEE virtual talk series 2020. And to start with today's session, I first formally welcome our IEEE branch counselor, Dr. H.K. Sardana, for a welcome address. Yes, sir. Yeah. Greetings. Good morning in uh, this part of the world. And good evening, Jason Mays and others who are elsewhere. Really nice yeah, to see that. Yeah, really nice to see that we could reach Jason uh, and Google in that sense to learn uh, virtual talk series with, uh, you know, machine intelligence, machine learning, and that too in Java. So uh, I hope the youth developers and others and everybody, kids, young and old, everyone probably would find uh, your talk very interesting. And in person, I am looking forward to hearing the best of machine learning that you would be sharing and uh, I, I wonder uh, you would speak less in JavaScript so that I can also understand. <laughs> so uh, welcome uh, Jason and everyone uh, who is attending this seminar, virtual talk and hope we will have a wonderful session today. Over to Anupama to welcome and invite him formally for this talk. Yes, thank you so much sir. So I extend my red carpet welcome to our keynote speaker, Jason Myers from Google. So he's currently working as senior developer advocate for TensorFlow JavaScript at Google. And Jason com combines his knowledge of the technical and creative worlds to solve complex, strategic, and technical challenges for Google's largest customers and internal teams. Developing innovative world first utilizes the latest technologies and hardware and this is the key component of his role to rapidly prototype new ideas and consult on project solutions globally. So with this brief intro, I welcome you, Jason, for your talk. Yes, over Very to much. you, Jason. Thank you. I'm just going to uh, share my screen. Give me one second. Hmm. Okay, so if you, if you can just confirm, you can see my slides right now. Yeah. Yes, we are yeah. able to. Okay. Perfect. Wonderful. So welcome, everyone. Uh, yes, I'm Jason. I'm the developer advocate for TensorFlow.js here at Google. And that basically means that if you're using machine learning in JavaScript pretty much anywhere in the world, there's a good chance that our paths will cross at some point. Now, before I get started into um, the world of JavaScript and machine learning, um, I'm just going to go a little bit over my background, because I often get asked this at the end of the talk anyway, so I'll just cover it now very quickly. Essentially, my, my career started as a computer scientist at the University of Bristol, where I specialize in web and mobile technologies, re reality mining, and invisible computing, these kinds of areas. I then graduated and joined uh, several startups as a web engineer. Um, I then moved into full stack web engineering, learning uh, both front end, back end, design, UX, all these kind of components. Um, that allowed me to then go wide and become a creative engineer, where I was then responsible for making prototypes for a number of people. Um, and basically, um, that led me to my role as a developer advocate here at TensorFlow.js. So if there's one thing you take away from this slide, it's that I spent half my life using JavaScript. <laughs> so I'm very passionate about JavaScript, and there's some good reasons for that. So why do we want to do machine learning in JavaScript? That is the first question. Um, first of all, um, you can use machine learning wherever JavaScript can run. And that is actually in many different locations. So for example, in the web browser, 
on the server side, desktop, mobile, and even Internet of Things. And if we dive into each one of these areas, you can see many of the technologies you may have heard of before. All of the common web browsers are there on the left-hand side, Node.js on the server side. We've got mobile uh, for React Native, WeChat, progressive web apps, uh, Electron for native desktop apps. Oh, one second. Some people are saying they can't hear me. Can, it, can everyone hear me? We are able to hear you. OK, I think um, whoever's saying they can't hear me, you need to check your speaker settings. The rest of the people can hear, you, hear me. So uh, check your computer settings, please. Um, so we've also got um, desktop, um, which we support Electron to do native app, uh, desktop apps. And of course, uh, Raspberry Pi to do Internet of Things. Um, so basically, TensorFlow.js allows us to run, retrain via transfer learning, and write our own machine learning models completely from scratch if we so desire. And that allows us to do pretty much anything we could want, from augmented reality, um, sound recognition, conversational AI, sentiment analysis, and much, much more. Now, there's three ways we can use TensorFlow.js, depending on your experience, both in JavaScript and machine learning. I'm going to go through those ways now. Now, the first way is to use our pre-trained models. These are really easy to use JavaScript classes for common use cases, and you can use them in just a few minutes. Really easy to get used, uh, to get started with. And we've got several of these. Here's just a few of them on the slide right now. We support things like object detection, uh, body segmentation, so you can find out what pixels belong to the human body in an image, pose estimation to identify the pose of a body in an image. Um, We've got things like speech commands, text toxicity, and all this kind of stuff. Now, we've also got some new models that have come out recently, such as Face Mesh, that allow you to identify the key points on a human face. We've got Hand Pose to detect similar things for your hands. And of course, BERT Q&A model, which allows you to do question answering natural language processing live in the web browser. So let's dive into some of these models to understand how they work and what is available to us. Now, the first one I want to talk to you about is object recognition. Uh, this is actually using something called Coco SSD behind the scenes. This is the name of the machine learning model. And essentially, it's been pre-trained to recognize 90 common objects, things like dogs, cats, humans, um, you know, things like that. Um, and I'm going to show you a demo now of this in action. And, and just bear in mind, this is all running in the web browser. OK, so let me share my screen. Can you see me sharing my, um, my tab? Or is that not working for you? Can you see my tab changing in WebEx, anyone? <laughs> or can you still see my slides? Only slide. Hello? Uh, only slide we are seeing. Ob object. Oh, OK, I'm going to stop and represent in one second. Uh, let me try again. Application. Share. OK. Oh, no, that's one second. Sorry. <laughs> that's the same one. Mm, how do I share this other tab here? Let's try one more time. Room tab. Here we go. OK. Hopefully, you can now see the different screen. <laughs> um, so here is a live demo of um, yes. uh, the object detection in action. So this is just a web page. And you can see, as I click on these images, it can classify the objects in these images in real time. You can see it gives us the bounding box for all the items it finds. And notice how we can also see um, multiple objects in the scene being classified. Now, even better, I can actually enable my webcam down below here. And you can see this can run in real time in my bedroom right now. And it's actually classifying me as I am talking live to you all here today. So this is all running live in the web browser at super high frames per second in JavaScript. And that's really cool because the privacy is also preserved. At no point is any of this imagery being sent to a server for classification. Everything is running within the Chrome web browser in this case. Okay, um, So that's a really cool uh, point right there. Now, if I go back to the slides, one moment, I'll say reshare my screen. Reshare. And tab. There we go. So back to the slides. We also have other models as well, such as Face Mesh. Now, Face Mesh allows you to recognize 468 unique landmarks of the human face, as you can see in the animation on the left. 
This model is just three megabytes in size, and it can be used for pretty much you might dream, anything you might dream up, such as augmented reality. Um, as you can see on the right-hand side, Modiface, who's part of the L'Oreal group, have actually used this for augmented makeup try-on. And you can, the lady on the left is not actually wearing any lipstick at all. We're actually painting this on in real time using TensorFlow.js face mesh model. And she could change the shades of lipstick on her face by clicking the colors at the bottom of the screen there, and she could change the effect accordingly. So now people can try before they buy the makeup. And of course, in the current times where it might be not applicable to share lipsticks and things, which is a great way and a um, clean way to do so as well. Next up, we've got body segmentation. This model allows you to, to distinguish 24 body areas across multiple bodies all in real time. And you can see here on the right-hand side how um, that each person is segmented with different colors, and each different color represents a different body part. Now, even better, we can see inside of the body there are some lines, and this represents where we estimate the skeleton to be. So with this, we could actually do gesture detection or pose estimation, and so on and so forth. And just to prove to you how uh, uh, interesting these models can be, um, here's two prototypes I created in my spare time. On the left-hand side, you can see how I can remove myself and uh, making an invisibility cloak, much like Harry Potter. I made this in just one day, and you notice as I get onto the bed, in the middle image, you can see the bed deforming as I walk around, but my body is removed, all completely in real time in the web browser using JavaScript. So this is a pretty cool effect and took very little time to create. But um, I, I built upon this as well on the right-hand side. And I don't know about anyone else on the call, but I really struggle to know what size I am when I'm trying to buy clothes. So here, I created a tool that in under 15 seconds, it can estimate my body size and then tell me what size clothing I need to purchase on the website that I'm on for all the different brands that might be out there. Um, so you can see, it, as you start to get creative with machine learning, you can actually make some very powerful tools just using our pre-existing models that have been pre-trained to do certain things. And of course, you can go even further. This can give you superpowers. <laughs> and here's one person from our community who combined this with WebGL uh, 3D shaders. And he used TensorFlow.js combined with this to figure out where his face was, his eyes, his mouth. And then he was able to make these fancy effects, uh, shooting laser beams from his eyes and mouth in real time, all in the browser. So very powerful and very, very fast. But we can go further than that. What if we combine with other web technologies? There's a whole bunch of web technologies out there, such as mixed reality, WebGL. And this guy from Paris, also from our community, um, figured out he could actually scan a magazine and if he detects a body in the magazine using our body pics model, he can now extract that body and then place it in the real world, as you can see here in this animation. And he's got these really cool particle effects as well. And notice that this is actually running on a mobile phone using TensorFlow.js in the browser. And this phone is not a, a new phone. It's actually a couple of years old. So even better, it runs on older devices too. And I thought, well, you know, if we can do this kind of stuff, then what if I could teleport myself around the world? In these current times when it's hard to meet friends and family, I wanted a more personal way to be able to talk to people. And you can see in this animation here, I'm able to segment my body from my bedroom, um, as you can see in step one and step two. And then I can um, transport that information over the internet to a remote location. And using mixed reality, I can then place my body in a different physical location so that people can view me and speak to me, like we're having this um, video call right now, except I'm actually present in the space in your room, which is pretty cool. And all of this, again, is done in completely in JavaScript. There's no app installations. There's nothing else to do. You just go to a website, and it just works. And that is one of the beautiful things about JavaScript is that it just works when you go to it on a link. So the second way we can use TensorFlow.js is to use transfer learning. Now, once you become more experienced and you've outgrown of, uh, all the pre-made models that I've shown you just a second ago, you'll want to start training stuff on your own data. And of course, if you're familiar with Python and you've been doing this in the past before, uh, you can do exactly the same things you're used to doing in Python in JavaScript as well. So I want to go through a couple of ways in which you can do this. Um, now, first off, we've got the Teachable Machine. This is a super easy to use um, website that makes anyone able to use machine learning. If you've got any coding at all, you can train a custom machine learning model to recognize anything in your house right now. 
So I'm going to go and share my screen again to allow me to give you a demo here today. One second. Stop presenting. And let's go to the screen share application. One moment. And then Teachable Machine, where is it? There it is, Share Tab. So hopefully you can now see my tab. Um, so this is what Teachable Machine looks like. You'll notice that we can actually recognize uh, images, audio, and even poses. We're going to do images today. So I'm going to click on New Image Project. And you get this nice little interface here where you've got a number of classes down the left-hand side. You could add more than two if you wanted to by clicking on Add Class. But for today's demonstration, I'm just going to use two objects. Now, the first one is going to be my face. So I'm going to do uh, JSON face as the, um, the, the property here. I'm going to click on webcam. And you can now see that it's, uh, it's got the webcam live view. I'm just going to click hold to record to hold about, to click, click to record 33 samples of my face. And then I'm going to go to class two. And um, I'm going to call this one card. So I've got a deck of cards in my room. I'm going to click on webcam over here as well. And now I'm going to literally hold up my deck of cards that I've got and click hold to record. There we go. And I've got a similar number of images there as well. So now I just click on train model. And what's going to happen is live in the web browser, it's going to um, retrain the top layers of the machine learning model with the new data that I presented to it. So it has a chance of then classifying that in the future. And now you can see it's finished already. In just 30 seconds, it managed to retrain. And on the right-hand side, we're getting a live prediction of what it thinks it sees in the webcam right now. You can see right now it's predicting JSON face with 100% confidence. And if I bring the deck of cards into view, it now says cards. So face, cards. And you can see how fast that is. And we've managed to make that in just a few minutes um, here live on the show today. So I really encourage people to check out Teachable Machine in their spare time if they have a chance. And try recognizing things around your house too. And find the limitations of that too, to see where limitations of machine learning actually are, and when you need to have more data to be more robust, and so on and so forth. Cool. So back to the slides. One moment. OK, so back to the slides. Uh, now, Teachable Machine is great for prototypes if you want to make something quick and easy like you just saw. However, if you want to make a production level model uh, suitable for real world use cases, you're going to need a lot more data than you know, 30 or 40 example images. So in that case, we've actually got a solution called Cloud Auto ML. And this is one of our cloud-based uh, machine learning systems that allows you to make production level machine learning models. But it can actually export to TensorFlow.js as well. So it's very relevant for today's talk, too. And here you can see someone's trying to recognize different types of flowers. And all they've done is they've uploaded hundreds of folders of different types of flowers to the um, Cloud Auto ML system. And then they click on the Next button, and it gives them options on how they want to train the model. So they can go for higher accuracy, um, or they can have faster prediction time. And of course, you can never have both. <laughs> um, so you have to kind of have a trade-off between one or the other. Um, and as the engineer, you can decide what you want. You then click Continue, and it will take a few hours to go through all the different iterations that it wants to try. And eventually, it will give you the option to download the resulting model that was trained. And you can see here on the right-hand side, there's the option to export the tensorflow.js format. So all you do is you click on Export, and you download the resulting files, which you can then host on your website and use. And how do you use them? It's actually really easy. In fact, all the code you need to do this is on this slide here. Now, Hopefully, some of you are familiar with JavaScript and HTML. If not, this should be fairly self-explanatory, but I'm going to go for it anyway. So at the top here, we've got two script tags. They're simply importing some um, uh, libraries that we need to run the code. The first one is the TensorFlow.js library itself. And the second one is the AutoML library for the system we're just uh, using. Uh, on the next line, we've got an image tag, which is the uh, image we want to classify. In this case, I've just got a random daisy image from the internet. But this could be any flower we want to classify in the future. Or maybe you could have the webcam here instead. Okay. And then down below, we've got three lines of JavaScript, which is where all the fun happens. And on the first line here, we simply have uh, model equals await tf.automl.load image classification. And we pass the model.json file that we downloaded from the previous step. So all this line is doing 
is it's loading in the machine learning model we trained in Cloud AutoML on the previous step. We then grab a reference to the image we want to classify. In this case, we're going to get reference to the DAISY image above. So document.getElement by ID DAISY, and we store that in the constant called image. And then finally, all we have to do is do model.classify and pass it the image you want to classify. And we await the results to come back. Um, and when they come back, we'll have a JSON object that contains all the things we think we've seen in the image for our model that we uh, have trained previously. And just in three lines of JavaScript, essentially, um, you can actually then run that and, and uh, make things like you saw I created before. So very simple to use and super easy to get started with. And I highly encourage people to try out Cloud Auto ML if you have a chance. And then the final way to use TensorFlow.js, of course, is to write your own code. And this is for the more experienced users, people who really know machine learning. And for that reason, I'm not going to go into the coding for this because um, it would require a whole book <laughs> just to explain all the low-level features of TensorFlow. However, I'm going to concentrate on the superpowers and performance benefits you can get by using JavaScript in this use case. So here you can see that um, TensorFlow.js actually comes with two APIs. There's the high-level API called the Layers API, and that's very similar to Keras if you've used Python before. In fact, if you know Keras, then you have no problem using the JavaScript equivalent of this with our Layers API. And then we also have the low-level Ops API, which is sorry, the more mathematical layer to do all the linear algebra and that fun stuff. So putting this together, you can see that we have our pre-made models that sit on top of the Layers API. The Layers API sits on top of the Ops API, and then that lower level layer can talk to different um, environments, such as the client side, for example, the web browser, WeChat, React Native, that kind of stuff. And each environment understands how to talk to different backends. So it can run on the processor. It can run in WebGL, which is the GPU in JavaScript. Um, or it can run in WASM, which is WebAssembly. And that just means it can run faster on the CPU because it's got more low-level instructions we can make use of. And then the same is true for the server side as well. So on the server side, you would use Node.js. And Node.js has the same TensorFlow bindings to the CPU and GPU as the original TensorFlow does in Python. So there's actually no performance difference in Node.js compared to Python. In fact, sometimes it can be faster, as we'll see in just a second. Now, if you are using Keras in Python, you can actually load in saved Keras models via our Layers API in Node.js. And the same can be done with TensorFlow saved models via our core or ops API. And then if you would like to convert a Python model to run in the web browser, you can use our command line tool called the TFJS converter that will take a TensorFlow saved model and convert it to the .json format that we need to run in the web browser, essentially. So that's basically our stack. And I promised you a little talk on performance as well. So you can see here at the top, um, so this is for the mobile net model, which is basically image classification. And on the graphics card in Python, it takes 7.98 milliseconds to execute. In Node.js, it takes 8.81 milliseconds. So for all intents and purposes, it's the same. Um, it depends what the server was doing in that moment of time. Is any millisecond or so difference. Um, and essentially, um, what gets really interesting is that when you have a lot of pre or post processing, and for those of you who are new to machine learning, often for the machine learning model to work, you need to convert the original uh, input data into a numerical format that it can digest. So that takes some non-trivial amount of effort to do properly and to clean up properly. And if you have a lot of pre and post processing, then you can actually have faster performance in Node.js because of a just-in-time compiler of JavaScript. Uh, and that's a, a feature that's unique to JavaScript, but it compiles at runtime, which is really, really cool. That means it can optimize at runtime too. And you can see here, uh, Hugging Face, who are very famous for natural language processing, um, for their distilled BERT uh, uh, model for natural language processing, just by converting to Node.js, they saw a two times performance boost, as you can see here on the charts. So that's pretty cool for free, for doing pretty much no extra work. You managed to get this performance boost, um, which is very, very nice indeed. And then if we concentrate on the client side, there's five superpowers you get by using TensorFlow.js in the web browser. The first one is privacy, as we hinted at at the beginning of this talk. Because we're running in a web browser, none of the data is ever sent to a third-party server for classification. So that means you're protecting the user's privacy. And this is really important if you're dealing with medical data, legal data, or maybe you're in Europe and you have the GDPR rules and all this kind of stuff. Um, second, 
lower latency because there's no server involved. Um, everything is happening on device, right where the sensors are. So there's no 100 millisecond round trip time to the server and back again just to wait for the result. Uh, next point is lower cost. Because there's no server, you can save potentially tens of thousands of dollars for a reasonably busy website by not having to hire expensive CPUs and GPUs in the cloud. And then finally, um, we have interactivity. The web was designed to uh, be interactive from day one. It was designed for the sharing of content, information, graphics, and we have really rich libraries compared to other systems. Um, in fact, I just want to show you a demo of the face mesh in action because it, it shows how rich the libraries are to go beyond just the machine learning. So let me just share my screen one more time here. Um, stop and go over to screen share, application. In second. <laughs> oh, WebEx is taking time here. OK, there we go. Perfect. So if I go to, hmm, where is it now? Here we go. Perfect. Here you can see um, face mesh running live in the web browser. On the left hand side, you see my face being classified in real time. But because JavaScript has such rich graphic support for 3D as well, you can see on the right hand side, I'm actually able to render a 3D representation of my face with a 3D point cloud all at the same time. And you can see I open and close my mouth, and on the right hand side, it all, it all happens as well. And this is currently running on the processor of my computer at around 20 frames per second. If I were to switch to WebGL here, um, it would be much, much faster um, because I could then use the graphics card to do the same thing. And then I'll get closer to 45, 50 frames per second on, on my current computer that I'm using, which is pretty nice. Um, so back to the slides, one moment. <clears throat> cool. So you saw how um, TensorFlow.js can be very interactive due to the rich libraries in JavaScript. And then the final point here is reach and scale. Um, anyone can click a link in a web browser and open it up. Not everyone can install Python on a Linux server and then install TensorFlow with the CUDA drivers and all this other stuff, clone your GitHub repository, and then understand all those notes you have that only you understand <laughs> in order to get it running. So uh, it's a much less uh, um, high barrier to entry here if you can just give someone the link and the machine learning just works. And that can be great for researchers who are trying to de deploy their models at scale to get feedback. Maybe people can help you uncover hidden biases in your models or bugs and so on and so forth. Um, and the web allows you to do that. And in fact, um, we can actually have graphic card support for 84% of devices via WebGL, which is not possible if you're using Python and TensorFlow.js, which only supports NVIDIA graphics cards. So that's something to consider there. And then here you can see the um, benefits for server-side uh, Node.js. Um, we spoke about some of these before. So first of all, we can use TensorFlow's save model without conversion. So if you do prefer to use Python for your machine learning pipeline, that's completely fine. However, you can then merge with a web engineering team very easily by allowing them to take that save model within Node.js. Uh, point two, you can run much larger models than what you can do on the client side. So the client side has a limitation of a couple of hundred megabytes per tab in the web browser. And this is a web browser limitation. Um, whereas if you're running in Node.js in the back end, you can have as much RAM as you like, however big your server is. So you can run much larger models on the server side. Um, you can code in one language. Currently, 67.8% of the world use JavaScript. <laughs> That's a lot of people, uh, a lot of developers out there. Um, so there's a good chance if you are going to collaborate with someone, they know how to use JavaScript already. And that means they don't have to learn a new language just to do machine learning, which is pretty nice. Um, fourth point, uh, once again, a really large NPM ecosystem for all the modules on the back end. And then the fifth point, we spoke about this already, performance. We've got the same C bindings as Python TensorFlow, and we've got the just-in-time compiler of Node.js and JavaScript, which allow us to do the pre- and post-processing much faster. So some resources. Um, if there's one side you want to you want to bookmark today, uh, take a screenshot of this one. Um, all the resources to get started are available right here. So this is the official TensorFlow.js website over here. We've got our models that you saw and many, many more that you can ex explore on this, this link down below. Um, we are a completely open source project. So if you want to contribute, you can check out our GitHub code. And then if you have more technical questions, we have a Google group, which is available at this alias. 
And then for those of you who are familiar with, with web technologies, you may have used CodePen or Glitch.com. Uh, glitch and these are really cool sites because it allows you to fork working code and you can actually live code in the web browser without having to install anything. Um, so very powerful and in minutes you can take a few examples I've written and start using them for something useful that you want to make as well. And then if you want a book, um, the one we recommend right now is Deep Learning with JavaScript. There's actually a 30% off deal that we have if you use made with TFJS in the discount code box um, at checkout, we get 30% off this book as well, which is kind of nice. Um, and this book goes from complete beginner. If you, as long as you know some JavaScript, it will take you from complete beginner in machine learning to um, being a hero by the end of the book, covering things like uh, simple linear regressions all the way to generative networks and convolutional neural networks, all this fun stuff, which allows you to do very, very fancy things. <laughs> um, so the only thing I have to say is come join the community um, if you do. Use the made with TFGS hashtag if you make anything cool. Here's just a few examples of people around the world making cool things in just the last few months. Um, but we get new submissions every single week, honestly. So um, do check those out over on Twitter and LinkedIn. Just search that hashtag and you'll find tons of cool content. And what will you make? That's the only question left. Um, this, this last piece of inspiration is a guy over in Tokyo in Japan. He's actually a, um, uh, a dancer by day. But he managed to use TensorFlow.js to make this really cool hip hop video, as you see on the slide. Um, so what this means is machine learning really now is for everyone. And I'm super excited to see how people can embrace JavaScript and TensorFlow.js uh, for creatives and artists and musicians and everyone else in the world who've previously been left out. <laughs> so I encourage all of you, no matter what your background, to come check us out and, and give it a go. Everyone is able to make something using something like Teachable Machine or whatever your preference is. So do give it a go. Uh, and let us know what you make. And if you want to stay in touch with me, um, feel free to check me out on Twitter and LinkedIn. I post a lot of stuff about machine learning, uh, web development, graphic design, UX, all that kind of stuff. So uh, happy to uh, talk to you over there as well. And with that, that concludes the talk. So feel free to ask any questions you may have. I can take those now as well. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Jason, for the very phenomenal session. I congratulate you for delivering a very fantastic talk. Thank you. So uh, we have so many. Uh, we have some uh, questions in the chat window. So yeah, shall I read them for you? Uh, yes, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, first question is from Arjun. Models that you have shown on ML, like making a person from Maxine, using yeah. visible using two cars or eyes. So well, for trials, if yes, that would some web. Link. Yes. Uh, so basically, the models that were used to create those demos are completely free. They're completely open source. You can find them on the website link I just shared. I'll paste okay. the links into this chat right now, just so you've got them one second. Let me just do that right now before I forget. <laughs> um, yeah. And you'll be able to then use those links as you need. One second. Let me just copy those. There we go. So. There's all the links from the slide. Um, yeah, and basically, yeah, um, if you go there, it's the second one down, that shows all the models that we've created. And the ones I showed today, we're using the body pics model and the face mesh model. Those are the ones that uh, the demos were created with. Um, the people who made those demos, um, they may have open sourced their code as well. You need to check with um, the people who made it. <laughs> um, but if you just search for made with TFJS hashtag on Twitter, you'll find these people and you can talk to them and ask them questions about their projects. Um, but yes, all of this stuff is free and open source uh, um, for the models that we create. OK, so there's one another question from Rahul. He's saying that what are the recent research areas in machine learning? <laughs> so could you comment um, on them or highlight some of yeah, them? Yeah, there, there are hundreds. <laughs> I mean, we've got, we've got um, computer vision, natural language processing. There's uh, generative creative models that allow you to um, like generate faces and things. There's like there's so much um, stuff going on right now. Um, there's there's voice synthesis and um, speech recognition, um, object detection. There's, oh my gosh, like anything you can think of. There's probably yeah. a machine learning research area for it right now. <laughs> um, so it's a very exciting time to get involved. Right, at the very beginning of potentially a very big evolution right now, and the people who are starting right now will be in very good. Um, uh, shape for the future when I personally believe every industry will be influenced by machine learning in some capacity. 
um, and you know, we just be able to optimize things better than we've done before as a human race. <laughs> so um, it's very exciting time to be alive right now. Well, the next question from Janvi. Yep. So she's asking that which one is most preferred, machine learning in Python or machine learning using JavaScript? Yeah. Um, so the preference depends on you and what you want to use it for. Um, if you only know Python, then feel free to use Python. No disadvantage to that. Um, if you are willing to learn JavaScript, if you don't know it already, then do check us out. Um, you, you, as I said, you get some benefits that you just can't get with Python, such as the privacy and the running in a web browser and this kind of stuff. So um, for those reasons, you might want to consider us if you want to reach tens of thousands of people then having your demo in a web browser could be very advantageous to you for your for the thing that you're trying to create. Um, but yeah, it depends what you're trying to do and how you're trying to use it. Uh, obviously, we are a, new, a much newer team than the Python team. <laughs> so uh, the TensorFlow is owned by uh, Google. It's an open source project by Google. It was originally written in Python. And then two or three years later, the TensorFlow.js team was born. So we're kind of two or three dot, two or three years behind in terms of progress, I guess. <laughs> but we're catching up very fast. And um, I think once JavaScript developers realize the benefits of machine learning and how powerful it can be, um, there's potentially 10x more people who are going to be using it as well. So I'm very excited once um, people start learning it to see where it goes. So it just depends what you're more familiar with right now as to what you want to use. Uh, both are completely adequate to do whatever you want. OK, thank you. So next question is from Vida. So he's asking, is image processing faster using TensorFlow as compared to other uh, processing platforms? Uh, it Can depends on the efficiency of your code. So, <laughs> so uh, if you write bad code, then you're going to have slow code. Um, you know, uh, if you have very large models, it's going to take more mathematics to do uh, all the mathematics in that model. So um, it depends on the size of the model, how efficient your architecture is, and all this kind of stuff, and the operations that you're using. So I don't think it's a library. Uh, situation. Both can be very, very um, efficient in speed if you write it in such a way. And that comes down to optimization and other things, which is a topic beyond this 30-minute discussion. <laughs> um, but yes, there's plenty of resources out there for like high-performance machine learning and uh, high-performance JavaScript, high-performance Python, whatever language is your choice. And um, that will help you uh, optimize those things. So uh, another question from Pradipta. So she's asking which language supports maximum libraries for machine learning or AI? Yeah, so right now Python probably has more support um, for machine learning libraries because it's just that, that's been the go to thing for academics at universities for a long time. I think most universities teach Python, so the academics tend to use Python because of that. Um, however, as I said, JavaScript is growing fast, but we don't have as many libraries as Python does right now. Um, in fact, I think we are the only um, kind of production-ready JavaScript library um, at the moment, but I'm aware of at least. So there might be a few others coming out, I don't know, but the ones, uh, ones I've heard of, we're pretty much the only one out there right now. So um, there's some other smaller libraries that do exist, um, like synaptic.js, but they're not fully fetched for production-level um, ML. Okay. So there's one other question from Aryan. And some more have the same question related. So they are saying, yeah. as a beginner, they are facing issues. Some say learn Python. Some are saying learn C, C++, and further. So uh, according <laughs> to you, which is the best preferable language and what sh they should follow for future? Sure. Um, so languages, like, you know, I, I don't want to get into any language wars here. <laughs> it's a very dangerous area to go into. But um, basically, my bias, of course, is JavaScript. I've been using it for 16 years of my life. So I'm very um, confident in using JavaScript, and I can be very fast in making the prototypes. So you saw the prototypes I created. I made them in just a few days each. And um, I feel it's a very flexible language to do things like that. However, if you are more experienced in C++, if you're more experienced in Python, then please do use that. Use whatever you like the most. And that's as simple as that. You can do all the things you need to do in all of these languages, honestly. So um, don't get hung up on the language choice. Just use the language that you enjoy using the most. Um, and then if there are any specific needs that you have, such as you need it to run in the web browser, then obviously your only choice there is TensorFlow.js in that case, because um, you have to use JavaScript to run in the web browser. But if you don't need to run in the web browser, then of course you can consider Node.js or Python on the back end, or even C++ 
with some kind of uh, exposed API or something. So it's completely up to you, uh, depending on your use case. Your use case and your language knowledge is basically what will define uh, what you use. OK, yeah. so next question is from Anand. So he's asking why we use CPUs as we have GPUs in present time and yeah. GPUs take less time in uh, less training time. So could you yeah. comment on that? Yeah. Yeah. So TensorFlow.js supports both CPU and GPU. You can choose what to execute on. Um, now, some some devices don't have graphics cards, like some older mobile phones, some cheap laptops. They don't have graphics cards. So in that case, running on the CPU uh, can be your only choice. Um, in other options, um, there's actually, um, at least in TensorFlow.js, if you're running in the web browser, it can be faster to use WebAssembly, WASM, because of the overhead in pushing data to the graphics card, which is a completely different architecture. So essentially, there's a small overhead. So for smaller um, models, so under three megabytes in size, it can be more efficient to run on the CPU, and you'll get a faster performance than on the GPU, actually, uh, for, for that use case. However, for larger models, you can get better performance on the GPU via our WebGL implementation, for example. So um, it, yeah, it depends on the model size and uh, your use case and the device that you're working on as to what architecture you'll run on. Yeah, OK. So next question is from Dagriti. So she's asking, yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. So, um, so yes, the web is a very unique system in that uh, you have the front end and the back end. The front end is your Chrome web browser or your Firefox web browser, whatever web browser you're using. That's known as the front end. And in the front end, you execute JavaScript. OK, now, if you are running on the server side, so in the cloud somewhere, then you use Node.js. Node.js is just JavaScript, but it's a it's a specific form of JavaScript that's been designed to run in a server-side environment. So you can access things like the file system, for example. So you can access databases and things like that. Traditionally, JavaScript on the front end does not allow you to access the file system to keep things secure. Because obviously, if you went to a website and it could just browse all your, all your files on your system, that'd be very, very bad. So JavaScript is very secure on the front end, and it has some things omitted for security. And Node.js essentially brings those features back so that you can actually use it on the server to do more advanced things if you so desire. But basically, it's all just JavaScript. <laughs> yeah. OK, so could you suggest uh, some hardware for real-time image processing? One of our participants is asking this. Um, I mean, for TensorFlow.js, like, you can use anything. <laughs> um, I've seen okay. people uh, run it on a Raspberry Pi, uh, one of our models, to detect a, an image. If a, if a door is open or closed, and then automatically um, close the garage door if they've left, the, left it open after a certain time. So um, you can use it, TensorFlow.js can run anywhere, which is kind of its, its key unique point, I guess. Um, um, I, I've got my, my mobile phone here. I can run TensorFlow.js in the web browser on my mobile phone. I can run it on my laptop, on my tablet. Um, so it, the hardware is it, pretty agnostic, actually. That's one of the cool things about JavaScript is that it doesn't depend on any particular hardware. As long as you can run JavaScript in the browser or in Node, then you're good to go. <clears throat> Another question is from uh, Raka. So uh, yeah. asking that in the JavaScript library, single threads download synchronously. So which might yeah. throttle the performance? So how to have yeah. them? Yeah. So actually, when we're downloading models from the server, we actually, um, when, we, when we create the model, we shard it into four megabyte chunks. And that allows the web browser to do parallel downloads. So whilst each download is a single thread, you can actually spawn multiple threads now in JavaScript to, to um, uh, have multiple concurrent downloads, I believe up to six in Chrome. So then you can actually download things pretty much six times as fast, <laughs> um, which is kind of nice. So you'll notice for all the TensorFlow.js examples, when you download the model, if you look at the Chrome um, developer tools and go to the network tab, you'll see like uh, a whole bunch of files coming down in parallel. And that's because uh, we've optimized it to be fast to, to do that, in fact. So you can shard things if you want to make things download faster. <laughs> OK, so there's one general question. That which yeah. language has a better future for the next 10 years or more according to your uh, perspective for the upcoming industrial market? Yeah, I think they all have. For bright futures, but for different reasons, honestly. So I think 
Um, obviously, Python is not going to be going anywhere, and for research, it's going to be having a bright future for the, for the foreseeable future. I don't see any change in that. I think JavaScript will open up new opportunities for people to deploy in ways they've never deployed before. Imagine you're creating a website and you can automatically crop images because you know where the human face is in the image. Or imagine you're creating some video conferencing software that can blur the background or replace the people in the background because you can see where they are and remove them like you saw in my demo. All of this stuff is now possible. So I think they'll have, both will have bright futures, but for different reasons. I think JavaScript for, um, for uh, kind of front-end applications and implementations for production use cases and creativity and Python for academic research. Um, and of course, there's always going to be some stuff going between the two. As you saw, we can take Python models and use them in JavaScript. So sometimes some of the Python research will just come through to JavaScript automatically as well. <clears throat> okay, so next question is from uh, Anushri. So is there any way to deal with data limitation issue in TensorFlow? Data limitation in the uh, So the only limitation uh, in TensorFlow.js is on the front end, as I mentioned. Um, the web browser has a limit of a few hundred megabytes uh, for the, each tab that's open. And that's because uh, of the way browsers are designed. Because obviously, everyone has many tabs open these days. So if you have unlimited RAM per tab, then of course, you could end up um, eating up all the RAM. So basically, um, in order to get around that, you simply just use node.js on the server side. And then it can use all the RAM and resources as you would do in Python, because it actually talks to the same C++ bindings that Python does. So in terms of how it can leverage things, it's exactly the same as Python on, the, on, on its resource usage there. Okay, so next question is from uh, Vira. So any yep. real-time project that you know, uh, which has a combination of Python and JavaScript, either in Intel platform? Could you yes, so the an example I'd give would be the um, the case study I spoke about earlier in the presentation by Hugging Face, they okay. used um, their Python trained model um, in, in the Node.js environment on the server side, and they managed to get a two times performance speed increase. And this was a natural language processing model. So what it does is it allows you to analyze text and understand the meaning of the text and this kind of stuff. So very powerful tools. And you can check out Hugging Face, or if you just do a Google search for them or something, you'll, you'll find um, all their details, but there's a lot of people are experimenting with, with taking Python models, exporting to save model format, and then running it in Node.js to then to, like, allow everyone to try it out and use, or use for a, a web use case, or, or even an application use case on the, on the apps and things. So um, uh, do try that out. It could be a lot of fun, and a lot of potential um, research can be reused and, and scaled that way, in fact. Okay, so next question is from Jagruti. Yeah. So what's the difference between Java and JavaScript? So the basic question. <laughs> question. Yes. So there, there is actually zero relation at all. Um, ham is the hamster as Java is to JavaScript. There's no relation between ham and hamster. <laughs> so um, it's the same uh, kind of situation. Java is just a completely different language. Um, and JavaScript is, 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 is the web language. Um, there's no relation between them at all. Mm. OK, so what are the careers associated with image processing? So any, could you comment something on this? Um, image processing. I, I mean, I, I guess there's a lot of computer vision research going on that um, would need this kind of work. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm not a career expert okay. on, that, on that area. But I mean, uh, <laughs> you can imagine how computer vision can be used to do many things. If you can recognize something in an object, sorry, in, in an image, um, you can trigger an event to happen, or, or you can make a, a Nest smart webcam. You, you, you could do so many things. It, it, you could be in hardware, you could be in software, and if you can recognize things in imagery, then you can you can make robots, you can make smart cams, you can do anything you want. So um, I, that's a very open-ended question. I'm not sure how to answer that. There, there's many <laughs> careers possible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So one last question from Aditya. So which skills are required to learn uh, start learning ML? So just, uh, yeah, um, then, yeah. there's no real skill needed to learn machine learning. Um, uh, just the willingness to actually take the time to read some things, because it's not an easy subject to get your head around the first few times. <laughs> and I actually made a machine learning deck called uh, Machine Learning in 45 Minutes or Machine Learning 101. 
once again, if you search that on the internet, you'll find um, a deck of slides I created. It's about 101 slides, <laughs> but it gives you a complete introduction to machine learning in a very easy way. Um, and essentially, I put when I was learning machine learning, because I got frustrated that it was too hard. <laughs> and I, I put all my aha moments into one deck, and that was the deck I created. And it's been shared many times now, and um, it seems to be um, going down well with people with zero technical knowledge. Some people are technical experts, but just didn't even realize how it was working behind the scenes. And like, it just tries to break things down into its fundamentals and um, explain it in the, in the best way I could, basically. So I'd recommend checking that out. And then once you've done that, maybe check out the Google Machine Learning Crash Course, which is free to take as well. It's available online if you just search for that. Um, and that will go much deeper than my deck does. Um, but for that, you'll need programming knowledge in, in Python um, or, or whatever language of choice that you want to use. OK, so there's just a random question, which has yep. just popped in. So has Google put the format dot JSON before your name JSON? So I have both <laughs> as related. That's funny. You're not the first person to ask that. I'm not sure if you're the same person who came to a previous talk or not, but someone asked the same question. Yeah. Uh, no, JSON is um, a file format which stands for uh, JavaScript, JS, Object, O, Notation, N. So JavaScript, Object, Notation. And unfortunately, even though I would love it to be something to do with my name, it is no relation to me. <laughs> um, but it is my nickname at work. So people do call me that as a joke sometimes. So, <laughs> so um, yes, uh, it, it's, it's just something. Uh, it's a JavaScript object notation format. <laughs> OK, so one last question that has popped in. So uh, could you tell your knowledge representation? Uh, like, does this knowledge representation any relation with JavaScript and AI? Um, that's my, does the what, sorry? Uh, the person asking, uh, does this knowledge representation has any relation with JavaScript and AI? Oh, B, B, object notation. Uh, I see, I see. Um, so, so this is a common format that's used in JavaScript to transfer objects around, essentially. So it, it's, it's kind of like XML. If you've heard of XML before, it's this standardized way that you can format um, a bunch of stuff and send it. Um, to different languages and different systems um, in a way that's passable by other languages and systems. Obviously, if you're in JavaScript, you can actually just take the JavaScript object that comes from this and use it directly without passing because it, it is just written in JavaScript, essentially. Um, so that's very powerful for JavaScript developers. But a lot of other languages actually use JSON to transmit data anyway because it's just very convenient. <clears throat> OK, so as we are running short of time, so uh, we yep. can skip some questions. Yeah. So sure. uh, thank you so much. Uh, so no today's session, I just uh, I asked Dr. Sarana for a vote for thanks. Yeah. Yes. Uh, hi, Jason, once again. Uh, I, wish, uh, I wish to have a small query on, uh, you know, we find yeah. this Google applications, all social uh, scenarios and uh, the normal scenarios in real life so that's encompassing the largest possible canvas so yeah. how do we transcend from there to say some medical applications or some agro i mean some other strategic or some of the disaster situations you were showing me the body segmentation yeah yeah i was wondering you know we had some situation of you know how to find people under debris or sure. uh, you know situations yeah. where they, where we move from the clean social situations to yes to yes, the critical yeah. ones so how do you advise us to move further yeah so there's actually something called the google ai impact challenge which is held i believe once a year and it's actually targeting um non-profit organizations to do exactly these kinds of things um who are using machine learning for social good in some capacity so maybe it's in disaster recovery. Maybe it's a field analysis for crops analysis to find pests and things like this in, in farms in India. Or maybe it's um, uh, detecting pollution from power plants and all this kind of stuff using uh, satellite data. And uh, people all around the world are making uh, some extremely powerful models that are, are using machine learning to solve these kinds of problems, in fact. And of course, it comes down to obtaining uh, training data, good reputable train data, 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 uh, training data that's not biased. And you know, bias is a problem within machine learning field that you have to be aware of. Um, and a good example of that um, is if I was making a speech recognition system for English, 
Um, I'm from England. I might go and uh, sample voices from all of my friends in England. And then I think, oh, I've got a system that works beautifully because everyone I've tested on, it works lovely. And then I go over to the States in America and I test my system and it fails <laughs> because it doesn't understand the American accent. And this is a great example of how unwillingly you've introduced a bias to your system. And um, this is a thing that uh, can crop up from time to time. And it's important to understand the data that you're using to train your system and to ensure that it's representative of all the situations you're going to use it in in the real world afterwards. Um, so you need examples of all of those situations. And if not, you're going to end up with biases. So um, this is a very interesting topic in its own. And um, uh, this, this uh, is uh, what a lot, of, a lot of people are, are spending a lot of money to pay research into at these days. Yeah, you rightly mentioned bias. You know, the, uh, I was uh, keeping up a question. I don't know if time permits. You know, yeah. bias naturally links with the, you know, what they call narrow intelligence. Yes. So the bias mm -hmm. itself is probably the cause for narrow intelligence. When how do we widen this intelligence? Uh, are, ah. are so just, this just or to clarify, not, not a point for say server-based applications that you can have individual applications in a narrow bandwidth. So uh, yeah. we'll throw some light on you know people talk about narrow intelligence and they say it's far from human intelligence which is too yes. wide. Yeah. So uh, essentially, so right now we are in a world where we create narrow AI systems, and this is not to do with the bias or the training data that you're providing. It's just that um, it's just saying that the, the the task that the thing does is limited to a very narrow scope, such as object recognition or or um, text analysis. So it can do one thing or maybe a couple of things very very well. Now this is different to general intelligence, which is um, which is what a human is like, essentially, which can do many tasks very well with uh, very little training. Um, and, and that is like, we can't do that right now. As, that's just beyond our research capabilities. So, so essentially, um, narrow AI is where we work in today and for the foreseeable future, in fact, we, um, with the processing power that we have, the memory, the other limitations, um, uh, we, we can't, um, uh, we, we've not yet developed anything that can go beyond that. Um, and of course, uh, you know, trying to make something that is intelligent as a human is very, very difficult because we don't even fully understand how the human brain works yet. Although we take inspiration from it for machine learning on a very high level, um, no one really knows how the human brain truly works right now. So that's still an open research area. Oh, uh, it's wonderful. I think, uh, think your presentation went beyond expectations and of course, as per people could expect from Google uh, speaker like that. Uh, Thank so you very of, much. Uh, you know, time spent with us. I believe uh, there are huge uh, questions still pending and they will find some ways to reach you. Yeah. Or they will find some uh, web services and other help, uh, other, uh, you know, so sources that you mentioned. So sure. it's really yeah. helpful. As I, yeah, as I mentioned, I'm available on social media or just Google my name and you'll find me around. <laughs> so feel free to ask questions online. Yeah. Actually, oh, one question, uh, one interest, sorry to interrupt, one interesting yeah. question just came up. Uh, that uh, there are many uh, pre-built functions that are available in one development platform, but not with the uh, other platforms. So is there any kind of way or uh, additional effort one can build these specific functions to the other platform as well. This question was asked by Javed. Um, I'm not entirely sure which functions they're referring to. Um, so if you're talking about existing libraries and helper functions, if that might be in Python, and if they exist in JavaScript, then um, some things um, may have been ported and others will need to be ported at some point, maybe as people start to use machine learning more in JavaScript. As I, as I mentioned, our team is only like two, three years old right now. Um, so we're at the very beginning of a very interesting uh, uh, riding the wave right now. Um, so hopefully in, in the next like five years or so, all, all of our tooling will catch up with whatever they're used to. Um, uh, but we need people like yourselves to help contribute. We are an open source project. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, with, with that help, we'll hopefully get the parity that we need as more people start using machine learning in JavaScript. Yes, thank you. So now I again request Dr. Sardana for a vote of thanks. Yes, sir. 
yeah thank you jason and uh, thank you everyone uh, for making this uh, you know lecture series wonderful by participation of uh, the largest possible numbers and uh, thank you google thank you jason for bringing this machine intelligence javascript into the common uh, understanding hope this presentation makes a good history and people follow it for a long time thank you very much for being with us everyone and as a token of uh, recognition and appreciation uh, this certificate goes to uh, your account and thank you very much sharing a, a kind of memento from us that you can also cherish so thank Wonderful. you once thank again you for much. being with us it's a pleasure talking yes. to everyone today thank you for inviting me cheers thank you yeah request all the participants to turn on the video so we can have a group picture with jason to make it memorable <laughs> yeah Thank you, Jason. Wonderful talk. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers. Let me know when you're taking the photo, and I'll I'll wave or something. <laughs> yeah. Oh, here we go. Everyone's joining now. Hey, we can see some faces. Very good. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for joining as well. It's good to see so many people. I think we reached over a hundred people today. So yeah. Good job. Mm -hmm. joining us okay so thank you thank you thank you everyone thank, thank you. you cheers bye bye thank you, thank you so much thank you everyone